I want to welcome everyone to the University Principal Preparation Initiative's uh, fifth and uh, capstone session to the e-learning series. Uh, we really appreciate you giving uh, your time uh, to learn a little bit about uh, uh, educator preparation, the direction of educator preparation, um, and, uh, and the role of school principals uh, in, in leading schools. Um, we, uh, we hope uh, that this uh, capstone session uh, will encapsulate uh, many of the issues and ideas that uh, we've been discussing over these uh, past several months, um, and also raise provocative questions about the direction of our field, uh, where we're going and what to expect next. Um, so this uh, session is, uh, as I mentioned, the fifth in a five part uh, monthly learning series that highlights research, best practices and strategies um, aimed at improving educator preparation and specifically principal preparation. Um, I think you know that um, given our national situation, revitalizing educator preparation is incredibly important right now. Um, both to teachers and students in our schools, um, and also the leaders who will eventually lead those schools. Um, because our, our national goals are focused on educational equity and achievement, um, and this uh, generation and the next generation of leaders will help us to attain those goals as we strive to, to, to meet them. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a common refrain now that we are living in some pretty unprecedented times uh, where uh, there are some um, pretty major shocks to our educational system and the routines that we've established um, over time uh, to make schooling an accessible place for students uh, and a safe place for teachers to work and to learn. And I think uh, today's lesson, uh, session will really focus on making sense of those shocks. And we're really glad to have our session presenter here uh, to overlay some theory and practice um, onto our current experiences. So we're, we're glad that you've joined. This, uh, this e-learning series uh, is supported by the Center for Great Teachers and Leaders at American Institutes for Research, um, University Council of Education Administration, with support from the Wallace Foundation. Uh, we launched the e-learning series to highlight research and best practices in principal prep um, and explore the relationships of educator preparation programs with universities uh, and other, other providers working in partnerships uh, to make uh, educators the best that they can be. The series is really an outgrowth of the Wallace Foundation's University Principal Preparation Initiative a $56 million investment by the foundation in improving principal preparation. The series aims to share ideas and amplify our national dialogue around educator prep. Uh, so we're glad that, as I mentioned, we're glad that you joined uh, the session today. Um, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Matthew Clifford, uh, and I'm a principal researcher at American Institutes for Research uh, based in Chicago. Uh, I'm a former teacher, uh, system level administrator, uh, and now I've been studying uh, principles and principal pipelines and preparation uh, for the past 15 years. Uh, if you could advance the slide, Monica. Yes. Um, so we hope that we followed through on our promise to you um, at the beginning of this e-learning series. What we said that we would do is provide you access um, to uh, great minds who have been working to improve principal and teacher preparation uh, over many years. And we also promise to provide you access to tools and ideas uh, that could advance your practice, um, whether you're a district level administrator working with a preparation program, whether you're a principal um, who's advocating for a better teacher and principal preparation in your locality, or whether you're a university faculty member or state level uh, education agency member, um, all of these uh, folks have been joining these webinars uh, throughout and we're hoping that they're useful to, to you in your context. Um, what we aimed to do was really to distill the best ideas and provide these tools to you uh, for building innovative principal and teacher preparation practices. Um, we know that um, 
UCEA, AACTE, and other organizations have been investing in uh, principal preparation program improvement um, over a long period of time. Um, and we think that there are some excellent, um, strong practices in principal prep uh, that have de been developed. But as our world is changing, uh, we need to continue to, to develop out our practices uh, and improve uh, principal preparation. Um, if you have been able to join all five sessions, that's great. Um, thank you for your participation. If you happen to miss some of the sessions, we would encourage you to go to this posted at the end of this presentation, where you can find all of the presentations, presentation materials, and recordings uh, for all of the sessions. Uh, a special thanks to UCEA uh, and AACTE for helping us to uh, promote and communicate uh, the importance of this e-learning series. Uh, this session, uh, the fifth, uh, will feature uh, Monica Byrne Jimenez, um, Monica is here on the screen. Thank you, Monica, for joining us today. Um, Monica has been a joy to work with. Um, her bio is available on our website, of course, and we'd encourage you to click in and read it. I will just say a couple things about Monica. Uh, first of all, uh, she's the Executive Director of the University Council of Education Administration, uh, which has moved recently uh, to, the, uh, to Michigan State University. Um, I'm a University of Michigan graduate, so it's a bit of a rivalry, uh, but I'm living with it. Um, and uh, as the executive director, um, Monica uh, represents and works really closely with over 100 education leadership uh, uh, programs throughout the country. Um, UCEA is very active in supporting its members uh, through an excellent uh, con conference, um, through support of research, uh, through investing in graduate students and also convening uh, uh, professors, graduate students, university administrators together to think and reflect upon uh, the best uh, curriculum uh, for uh, preparing leaders for the future. Uh, Monica, uh, Monica's scholarship uh, uh, runs deep. Uh, she is focused on uh, Latinx uh, identity uh, within education leadership early career development of, of educational leaders um, and uh, research methodologies uh, to, examine, um, to examine leadership in practice uh, and also uh, to evaluate and provide formative feedback on, uh, on leadership programs. Uh, so all of that is, is um, incredibly important work. Uh, I've taken up too much time, but uh, I do have to make a plug for technology here and the way that we'll engage together because we want everybody to have the same opportunities uh, to engage with us. So uh, for the session, uh, we hope that you'll be able to mute your mic. Um, uh, as with Zoom, we've all come to learn these practices, but it's just kind of a reminder. Um, for questions, both technical and content related, please do use the chat function. Um, so we have, uh, a AIR has a, a group of staff members who will be responding to you if you do have technical issues and uh, they'll respond to you through chat. Um, I'll be monitoring chat throughout so that if burning questions come up, I will um, try to pose those back to Monica at the end of the session. So we encourage you to respond in chat and I'll raise questions throughout uh, to, to support that chat function. Um, and then as a reminder, many of you online today are part of the University Principal Preparation Initiative Network. And after this session, you're invited to join a post uh, presentation discussion. Um, if you're part of UPPI, you've received a link to the discussion website, which is outside of this website. So you'll have to go back to your email at the end of the session, click on that discussion session, and then log into another Zoom um, link. So, uh, so that's it for my technical overview. Um, Monica, um, take it away. Unmute myself and take it away. 
bienvenidos. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, my thanks to Wallace and to AIR for inviting me and, and helping me um, get to this point. Um, I think uh, I look, I'm really looking forward to, I appreciate the opportunity to think big thoughts and share those with you. And I, and I look forward to this afternoon's conversation and work. Um, today, I'm in East Lansing. Uh, I'm coming from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishina Abeg, uh, Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. I affirm indigenous sovereignty and history and experiences of those indigenous individuals and communities who live here now and who were forcibly removed from their homelands. In offering this acknowledgement, I affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. I know that you're all in your second or third month of school in an incredibly difficult and exhausting time. I'm sure that in your school communities, some may have lost a loved one to COVID. And maybe even among these, those listening uh, right now, you may be experiencing some of that as well. I wanna take a moment to honor those we may have lost and those who are living with that loss in your communities. Lastly, before I dive in, it's necessary to say that Black Lives Matter. As educators, we must recognize that many in our communities suffer the oppression, the consequences of systemic oppression and disenfranchisement. And as educators, we must be open to the fact that schools are often the sites of that oppression for Black, Brown, and Native children. I say those things because we can't talk about leadership in the context of multiple pandemics without taking a moment to recognize and honor our current realities. And so I thank you today for doing that with me. Here I just wanna show you what I hope to talk about in the next 30 minutes, sort of moving from my own positionality and what I bring to the table and, and what shapes the way that I'm thinking about the, the, the ideas that I'm sharing with you today. Talk a little bit about UCA. I mean, Matt already did, did some of that introduction. To really think through together what COVID's teaching us. Um, and also to very quickly say, um, to, to spend some time thinking too about what the next normal is and, and what this pull is for us as a, as a field, as a culture, to sort of be thinking about the next normal. Um, and then finally end up with some of my thoughts about what it's gonna take to lead our communities um, you know, through this pandemic and to whatever might await us next. I think um, in my own research, as Matt talked about, I explore um, uh, the connections among Latinx leaders uh, between their own racial ethnic identity, how they make sense of their leadership and how they enact that leadership. So again, it's impossible for me to talk about leadership without telling you a little bit about who I am and what those identities bring to this conversation. And, and for the purposes of today, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one. I am the daughter of immigrants. One of our first family experiences with schools was when I was in kindergarten um, and was told that my maternal language, which is Spanish, uh, would only get in the way of my achievement. Uh, when I went to school, I was Spanish dominant. Um, I probably knew a smattering of English, but I was Spanish dominant. And the teachers told my parents not to speak to me in that language anymore. Fortunately for me, uh, my parents ignored that advice. And to this day, we continue to speak Spanish at home. Um, and I like to tell people that I turned out okay, um, despite or maybe because of that first experience that my family had in school. Since then, um, my education has been uh, sort of partly to resist those forces that want to make me think that my own culture and my family is not enough. Um, and when I have not been successful in resisting that, which does happen occasionally, um, I've spent a lot of time and energy figuring out why we do this to children, um, both in my own research, but then also in my own understanding of schooling and my experiences. Um, and, and, and sort of effectively putting myself back together again, um, so to speak. So in many ways, my experiences in K-12 and in higher education um, have given me sort of the strength and the tools to help me reject this idea that we often um, create that, that education or children being in school or teachers in communities or, or either or, and really pushing us to think about what it would mean like to be if we were and with. Um, 
just recently, I was participating in a conversation with leaders doing um, development work, leadership development work across the globe. And I think one of the things that, that really hit, hit me there was that we are facing the same dilemmas. Um, we are trying to, to um, ask the same kinds of questions. And so the issues that are facing leadership, um, school leadership, district leadership, um, policy leadership in this moment actually go far beyond the confines of our, of our, of our nation. Um, and I think what was interesting to me about that conversation is it wasn't so much um, you know, what we have to offer, but rather what we have to learn from each other. Um, and then that was a really powerful moment in thinking about how we're connected um, beyond our, you know, our sort of day-to-day -day work um, and really being able to be open to the idea that, that several countries around the world and several you know, schools and leaders are, are being successful in the midst of COVID um, and thinking about, again, what do we have to learn from them? Um, at heart, I'm an optimist. Um, people who know me will probably tell you that. Um, I do believe that the only way we do better is together, and the only way to be together is to do better. Um, but I also recognize, you know, that that hope and optimism by itself is not a strategy, and that requires uh, strength and careful planning and constant learning. And so those are also um, skills and, t and I've learned along the way. Um, I think for today, there's really kind of two things I want to be able to, 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 to do. Um, one of them is to, is to build on previous speakers, as Matt was talking about, um, and what they brought to, to you for your consideration. And then the other one is to offer just one framework um, that might help us make sense of leadership in these times, um, and as a way to see, to make sense of what we're experiencing, but then also to be able to think about, well, what, what's the future hold for us? Um, I think, you know, Karen Holly Miles in her presentation talked um, about research that's pointing towards a new set of skills for leaders. Um, Ellie Drager Severson in her work talked about the importance of teacher feedback to instructional leadership um, and how that is changing in our virtual context right now. Um, David Eddie Spicer and April Peter Hawkins both talked about partnerships as being critical to supporting principal preparation, but also in advancing the, the district agendas on student equity and achievement and how together um, both higher ed and K-12 can, can begin to sort of weather some of these shocks that we're experiencing because of what's happening right now. Um, you know, in true form, I, I kind of have to make a disclaimer that, you know, that what I'm talking about today are, are really my own musings, reflections, and observations um, about what's happening and don't necessarily reflect um, what you see as an organization is in, in terms of policy or practice. Um, today is really an opportunity to sort of make time um, to reflect on the national landscape and to consider some of the implications for our work, um, past, present, and future, collectively from K all the way to 20. Um, and, and, and that's something that we at UCA are trying to do as well, which is why I, I you know, my, my title is working slowly into this, um, to make our, um, to give ourselves time to think about these things. Um, and it, it's sort of in that spirit of reflection and sense making that I'm offering my thoughts from, and sharing those with you today. Um, so I had the honor of leading this organization for 16 months now. Um, and like many of you, um, the uh, leading an organization in the past nine months alone has, has really tested my leadership um, and tested my leadership daily um, and has made me sort of question, um, you know, what is happening? Uh, what do we have to learn from each other? What, again, what specific skills that I bring and what are the skills that I need to learn? Um, the University Council for Educational Administration um, started in 1954 and was a consortium and now we are a consortium of over 100 universities across the country that are dedicated to and advancing the preparation, practice and study of educational leadership for the benefit of all schools and all children. Um, we represent the needs and the interests of faculty. Um, and graduate students in public and private institutions, uh, research intensive and teaching intensive institutions, HBCUs, HSIs, MSIs, and, and institutions in suburban, urban, and rural areas. So we do represent a very vast swath of leadership preparation in, in the US. Um, we actively initiate and lead educational improvement 
um, efforts through um, not just our research, but also in the um, improvement of preparation programs and redesign efforts. Our member institutions work collaboratively with schools and educational agencies to, again, positively influence local, state, and national educational policy, um, some of which is specific to schools and some of which might actually be specific to leadership. Um, and, you know, and as many of you, we constantly question and reevaluate our practice and our beliefs. Um, and we look at all of our partnerships and, and our relationship with our members as learning opportunities for the organization. Um, like all of you, again, we're committed to the learning and social development of all children. Um, the key important roles of educational leaders to the success of our children um, and the strengthening of diversity, equity, and social justice in our educational organizations. Um, uh, Matt also mentioned this, but I want to give another plug for our annual convention. Um, we've gone completely virtual this year, as many of your uh, learning opportunities have, um, and I hope to, to, if you're interested, and hope to see you sometime in November um, virtually. Um, I also, before I forget, wanted to thank the technical, the tech team, at AIR. Um, they've been fabulous in, in making sure that we run really smoothly for the next hour or so. So the question I've been asking myself um, for a while now, as I said, is, is not what am I learning from COVID, um, and that seems to be some of the focus, but rather what is COVID teaching us? And I think if we, if we shift that way and the way that we think about it, we begin to pay attention to different things and realize that, that we're being taught um, things that we, that we may or may not be ready to, to learn. Um, I'm a systems thinker. Um, and my training is sort of an organizational theory. Um, and I think I see the world in big picture ways. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm always looking for the relationship among systems. Um, my students will tell you that I, I'm constantly talking about nested dolls um, and how that helps us understand what happens in K-12 education. Um, and by systems, I'm talking about, you know, infrastructure, um, things like uh, access to the internet, uh, transportation, food. I'm talking about learning systems, uh, systems for human resources, etc. Um, and so we have ways of understanding, um, of naming the systems that that we um, that are, we are involved in. Um, but I, and oftentimes we think that systems are actually outside of us individually, or that they're impervious to to human action. Um, and yet systems like organizations are actually made up of people. Um, they're made up by people, for people, they're made up out of people. Um, and historically, um, they're made mostly, in schools in particular, they're made mostly for adults and by adults. Um, and they're historically have been made in, you know, for and, and, and um, by white men. Um, and so systems like organ, and systems, but we all participate in these systems and like, um, organizations, we maintain them consciously um, or not um, through shared norms and routines and procedures um, and the collective work that we do. Um, we also, our identity is also often closely linked to um, the health of the system that, that, that we work in. Um, and so there are lots of ways to think about and lots of ways to observe what it is that we do in schools. Um, I myself teach um, a lot of um, around the ecology of systems and the work of Broffenbrenner, who was a child development expert and who was one of the co-founders of Head Start. Um, and he talked a lot about how children are nested in these systems, some of which are natural, most of which are human made, um, and that those systems shape the experience of, of children and their opportunities for learning and growth. Um, and, you know, and they're, again, sort of this um, seeing uh, the systems that happen in schools as living things. Um, and I think if we take this systems approach and begin to think about what's been happening in the past, you know, six to nine months, um, you know, we're being taught mercilessly to a point um, that our systems are flawed in, in more ways than we, we have acknowledged in the past um, and maybe in more ways that we're willing to acknowledge now. Um, and at best, some of these larger systems are in disequilibrium and sort of at worst, some of them are sort of in tatters. Um, and I think that the way that our systems have been tested and the way that we're beginning to see some of the weaknesses in those systems are around the integrity of them. How do our systems work together? How do they align? How well do they maintain themselves without human sort of interaction? Um, 
you know, the flexibility of our system, how, how responsive and adaptive are we? Um, you know, how easily are we able to change from one direction to another, from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual? Um, you know, the equity of our systems has been highlighted and, and there's been a lot of conversation already about how um, the, the inequity or, or the inability of, of creating equitable systems is, is, is um, impacting children and teachers across the country. Um, the humanity of our systems, you know, as I said before, systems are made by people um, and our children are suffering and our teachers and educators are suffering um, and how much we're able to respond and support and create spaces where the humans that are in our system can actually um, become whole again. Um, and again, the sort of the globality of our systems and thinking about not only how we're connected within a community or even how we're connected across the country, but even thinking about how we're connected across the world. Um, and I also think a lot about globality in terms of ecosystems and the environment um, and how you know, we are intricately connected to the world and, and, and nature around us and our communities and, and what that might mean. Um, I think what's, what's always been a tough place for educational leaders is that they're, they're often put in these very vulnerable positions in which on the one hand, they're responsible for maintaining and regulating systems. We all want these efficient systems that continue to run. On the other hand, they're also responsible or tasked with changing and optimizing these systems to meet issues of equity in current contexts. Um, and these roles often contradict each other. So again, you know, sort of the, the, the complexity of what's happening in our schools, what we're being taught by what's happened in the past six to nine months and sort of the key role that leadership has in the midst of all of this, of this uncertainty. Um, and the one thing about systems is, and organizations is they don't like uncertainty. Um, you know, systems, and again, my organizational theory background, systems will always pull us back to the norm. They will always come to the status quo. Um, and so, you know, leaders in, in particularly right now are feeling the pressure to go back to the normal, um, while at the same time seeing and understanding and feeling very viscerally that that something different is needed. Um, and it's fascinating because at headquarters, we, we are in the process of, of um, doing a policy analysis of state reopening plans, um, artifacts that were created in response to COVID um, back in uh, over the summer, early summer. And, and one of the things that is, is you know, an interesting finding and, and something that we're observing across many of these states is that um, the, you know, we focused on these sort of very visible and measurable strategies that we could do as a way to help us deal with a lot of the uncertainty that was happening while really ignoring in many ways the more difficult and ambiguous challenge of how to um, rethink our learning systems and, and really um, rethink our human resources systems and how we do that in the midst of all of this, um, again, sort of uncertainty. Um, and so we find ourselves in a place where, on the one hand, we're aware that, that there is a lot going on that needs to be done differently. But then on the other hand, as I said, being pulled to like, let's, let's get to the next normal. Um, so for a while, everyone was talking about getting back to normal. And then there was a talk about like, what's the new normal. And then, and then now thinking about, well, what is, what is the next normal? And so I think, you know, in a way, for the next couple of minutes, I'm, I'm asking you to engage with me in something that's equal parts thought experiment and equal parts reality. Because what I've been thinking about, and you know, I'm a huge sci-fi uh, lover, and I, you know, I happened to reread Octavia Butler over the summer, and, and I keep telling everyone she told us about this, so everyone go and read Octavia Butler. Um, and, you know, this idea that that not only she, but many others have actually said that, you know, change, change is a constant. Um, and we kind of know that in our heads, but I'm not quite sure we've really begun to understand what that might mean for leadership, for leadership preparation, for partnerships, for the ways that we even think about schooling. Um, and so what, what's making me think and what I've really been challenging myself in these past few months is, you know, what is, what if there is no normal? 
Um, you know, what if, what if there never was one and we just sort of thought that there was or that there was a normal for some people and, there, and, and not for others? Um, and what would happen if we actually realized that normal may not be stability, but normal may actually be constant change? Um, with occasional chaos thrown in there for good measure. Um, and, and what would that mean if we kind of began to see that we're in a constant, we're in a constant state of flux um, and that this constant change is, is actually might and is what has been perhaps, but will definitely be, I think, moving forward, um, what quote unquote normal is. So if we think about these sort of changes as a series of crises that change as a series of crises that shock the system, to use the words used before, um, you know, how do we come to understand crisis? And it's really interesting because even as I say that and I think that, we don't have the language quite yet, I think, to be thinking about, you know, crisis is normal. Um, because that doesn't seem to make much sense, but but I think we will eventually develop some some you know language and some theoretical framing around this. Um, but I don't think we have that quite now. Um, and if we look at our national land you know landscape, we can see that that we've been experiencing that we experience crises routinely, um, both at at the national level, at the school and local level. Um, we often think that well you know that this one crisis will be the thing that changes things, that, that after this, things will be different. Um, and then surprisingly, we spend significant time and energy, again, trying to get right back to normal, um, in some ways thinking that we're addressing a crisis in other ways, again, this sort of just need to, to have, um, to understand this crisis as something of a blip um, or an anomaly. Um, and again, like that, that pull, that organizational pull is always going to be to stability. Um, and that will be constant conflict with this, what I'm trying to, to think through here, which is like, what if normal is constant change? Um, Peterson, who is a, a professor at Columbia Business School, um, studies strategic learning. Um, so I've been looking a lot at issues of crisis management, crisis leadership, um, and then came upon um, the work of Peterson around strategic learning. And, and he talks about this in relation to two different kinds of crises, episodic crises and emergent crises. And if we, if we take the story of the frog and the pot of water that we all, we all know about, um, episodic is when we put that poor frog into the boiling water and it is quick and catastrophic. Um, and, and our analysis of that, our sort of post analysis of that is that, well, once the water cools down um, and, we, and we make sure not to put a frog in the water again, everything will be fine. Um, um, and Peterson calls a sort of episodic bias, right? That we wanna think that this is gonna pass and we'll get back to normal. Um, but an emergent crisis is when you think about the poor frog um, in the water as we turn on the heat um, over time. And then it's sort of slow and relentless and uncertain and sort of equally catastrophic to the poor frog, um, but requires a different way of assessing learning in as we're going. Um, and so, so what does that mean sort of for learning and leadership and even for preparation? Um, you know, well, well, it's pretty clear. And I think, you know, most, most of us are, or most of our systems, most of our schools um, are pretty um, good at learning from episodic crisis um, because that's what we do. Um, you know, once something has happened, um, our system, you know, our learning system kind of kicks in and we have task forces and we have meetings and people write reports and make recommendations. And then we tighten up our systems so that that thing doesn't happen again. Um, now, whether or not we're completely successful in that, you know, is debatable. Um, Emergent crises, though, have lots, again, lots of unknowns, um, lots of uncertainty. And, you know, I'll keep saying this, and, you know, systems and organizations don't like that. Um, and, um, and so it requires a different kind of learning. And early on in, in you know, before, back in January, February, um, when we were just beginning to, to learn about COVID, um, I was listening to an, uh, an interview with one of the doctors and epidemiologists at the World Health Organization. And it was fascinating because he was talking about how they have certain protocols whenever something, whenever there's a new, um, you know, epidemic or something, there are certain protocols that kick in and they measure the knowns to the unknowns. And so, if it's a known, um, 
if they can say, oh yes, these are things that we're familiar with, um, take for example, something like Ebola, um, then a certain set of protocols are kicked off to address that issue. Um, if there are a lot of unknowns, like there were and continue to be um, regarding COVID, a whole different set of protocols is, is set off. And these protocols are all about collecting as much and as much different data as possible in order to sort of change the ratio of knowns to unknowns and then develop a treatment and, and a process for um, you know, developing vaccines and things like that. Um, I mean, clearly we're still sort of in the, the known to unknown ratio is still pretty high, but that can be said for many things that are happening um, you know, in education in, in the nation. Um, and so I think for emerging crises, we have to develop a different kind of learning system, not, and, you know, not one that waits until the end, but one that's happening as we begin to realize that we are in an emerging crisis. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting way to be thinking about what are, we, what are we paying attention to and what are we not paying attention to? And how often it's the things that we're not paying attention to that actually end up creating an episodic crisis. Um, and so again, sort of trying to think through, you know, if we see episodic crises as actually um, points in time of an emergent crisis, then, then what, does, what does that mean? Um, and, and as an example of that, I was talking just recently to somebody that, you know, when I was in the classroom in New York City 20 years ago, I was in a school where we couldn't drink, we couldn't use the water fountains. So our kids couldn't drink from, um, from the water fountains in the hallways. Um, so we had to have, they had to bring in their water, we had to have water available to them during lunch, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but that was 20 years ago. And then, you know, five, is it five, eight years now that we had the water crisis in Flint when the children couldn't drink the water either. Um, and if we look at these in terms of episodic crises, um, and given the communities that were involved and the locations, then it, it's easy to see these as episodic. But if you look at them in the long term, you begin to realize issues of water, um, of clean water and access to clean water is very well an emergent crisis. Um, and how can we begin to look at, well, what does this mean for our communities and what does this mean for our schools? Um, you know, what is it going to mean if, if continuing moving forward, there are thousands of children in hundreds of schools across the country who don't have access to clean water? Um, and, and how do we start thinking about that in sort of a longer term emergent crisis perspective? Um, and so again, it's like what I'm trying to think through, um, you know, in my own head, but also out loud with you now is like, well, what is normal? What does normal mean in these situations? And how does our search for the next normal um, really bias us towards thinking about leadership and leadership events as episodic crises, as opposed to an opportunity of thinking about things as an emergent crisis. Um, what's really interesting about that is that um, uh, the last bullet in, in this previous slide talks about how the window for learning and action is longer than expected in episodic crises. I mean, sort of think about that, right? That, that the window for learning and action is longer than we think. Um, and often because things become episodic, there is no opportunity to think and learn and we constantly react. Um, but what Peterson, Peterson often gives, um, he gives the example of a lily, a water lily in a pond and how long it takes for the water lily to take over the entire pond. Um, and in, in his, in this sort of thinking about that, um, the water lily, there's one water lily and it grows exponentially and it doesn't cover half the pond until day 28, which means that it is growing slowly, you know, exponentially, but slowly for 28 days. At day 28, when it's filled up half the pond, it fills up the rest of the pond in day 30. So in two days, it moves from half the pond to the entire pond. Um, and again, thinking about, you know, we only pay attention to it at day 28, but in reality, this has been happening for 28 days before, 27 days before that. Um, 
And then at that point, the learning, if we think about it as episodic, some people are going to think, well, we just fill in the pond and we won't have a problem with any more water lilies. Um, and it doesn't really give us an opportunity to think differently about what could be done to ensure that the little water lilies don't cover the pond. Um, so again, it's just thinking about if we if we if we be, if we stop thinking about crises as episodic in nature and begin seeing them as indicators in the emerging crisis, does that give us opportunities um, to re, to you know again that sort of quick learning or you know can we look at different data? Can we see what's happening? Um, who can we be talking to and what can be done um, in a much more thoughtful way than again what we often do and just respond um, to episodic crises. You know, so again, going back to my organizational theory roots, you know, Peter Drucker really challenges us to think about it's it's not the turbulence, it's not the crises or the change that are the or the challenge. It's that we're looking at them with what he calls yesterday's logic. Um, and so how do we lead an organization that will constantly be in this turbulence without thinking about or falling back on or sort of defaulting to yesterday's logic of what we've done in the past, um, which, is made, which is very much so sort of moving from episodic into emerging crises um, and thinking about issues of, of change and crisis as part of, our new, of, of the normal. Um, and what that really means is that, you know, in K-12 and in higher ed, um, we have to unlearn some things, um, some ways of being and doing, and we have, to re we have to relearn others. And of course, we have to learn completely new ones um, and understand that these may be different in different contexts, um, which again, systems don't like. They want everything, everything to do the same. And, but here, if we're gonna be responsive and if we're gonna be able to see um, change and emerging crises, and we have to understand too the importance of local context. So, you know, in thinking about what this means, um, I was recently in a conversation with someone who asked me um, that, you know, in the midst of, of all of all these multiple pandemics, um, you know, how does leadership preparation respond? And should leadership preparation sort of go back to basics um, and really focus on management and budgets and, you know, um, infrastructure and things like that. Um, and the question and their examples didn't actually surprise me because, again, it's, it's another indication of how we're constantly pulled to go back to, to um, the status quo. Um, and I remember when I was a cooperating teacher, when I was a student teacher, my cooperating teacher, you know, drilled into me the importance of planning because she always said that in a pinch, you will teach the way you are taught. Um, and so needing to really um, keep ourselves from defaulting to our old ways of doing things and our old ways of understanding what normal is and what that might mean for schools. Um, so of course my response to her was no. <laughs> um, that probably now uh, more than, than ever, we need to pay attention to sort of the ground, the personal groundings of, of our identity, of leadership, um, of seeing leadership as uh, a set of human interactions, um, of developing frameworks for leadership that people can then use um, to, to um, address and to understand what's coming. I mean, those frameworks, they're multiple frameworks. They could be distributive, they could be transformational, they could be disruptive. Um, but this idea of being open to and understanding the importance of um, those ideas conceptually, theoretically, in my mind, is even more important now than ever because everything is in such flux. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that I, I talked about, I've spoken about in the past is that, that leadership is personal. It is a personal human endeavor that happens among and between people. Um, and so this idea that, um, that, that we have to, that a leader is only as good as, as the people willing to follow them, the relationship between leadership and followership, um, as both, again, have needs and questions and strengths, um, and that, that need, they need to trust each other. And in order for that to happen, um, it's, a, it's, it's asking these sort of, again, enduring questions about you know, the personal, who am I? Um, what do I believe? Where am I from? 
um, how has that influenced what I, what I believe? Um, who, the interpersonal, which is who are we um, as an organization, as a community? Um, who are we and what are the things that we believe and hold in common? And then sort of strategic, which is really interesting because it's in the service of what? You know, what are we in service to? And I think it's interesting that to think about in service of what, um, in contrast or in partnership with in service to who? Um, because, um, you know, the idea of service to who could get a little complicated, but the in service of what might offer some more clarity. Um, and by asking and engaging with others and offering support, you know, we can purposely and authentically accelerate leadership and development because we're asking these questions of each other and of ourselves. And because you know, someone was talking to me recently about this and they, they, they said these are the bedrock assets um, that of leaders, that leaders have when they respond to crises. Um, so they're the bedrock, they're the foundation, um, they're the touch points um, that allow leaders to be able to do things with authenticity and integrity. Um, and that these are the assets at the heart of what we do as leaders, um, knowing ourselves. Um, helping others know who they are, creating spaces for those to be in kinship together, in family together with each other, in the search of something bigger than all of us. Um, you know, we all want what's best for our children. We all want equity. Um, and, and these are things that are bigger than any of us individually. And so I think, you know, um, it, I call these lessons, I think of them as tools. I don't exactly have the right word for this, but basically these are things that work. Um, in times of crisis, um, you know, leaders often are put in positions where they have to appear that they are in control. Um, even though uh, one of the greatest assets that we can provide for leaders and educational educators probably broadly is sort of comfort with ambiguity. Um, because so much of what we do is ambiguous. Um, and yet once chaos and crisis begins, um, the demand on leadership is to be, you know, to take control, um, to limit information, to limit access as a way of appearing to be in control. Um, and we know that in times of um, both episodic, but absolutely an emergent crisis that those things don't necessarily work and they don't work in the best interest of the community of the organization. And they certainly don't work to, to create the kind of trust that's gonna be necessary to weather crises. Um, and so this idea of like telling the truth early, um, getting out ahead and telling the truth and being transparent about that. Um, I know, you know, not far from where I am, there are two uh, districts that are, you know, neighbors and, and, and the leadership of those districts is doing very different things. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, they're both sort of fielding uh, uh, surveys to get input on opening or not opening um, on virtual and the needs of the community. One district is being very open and sharing that data back out with the community as a way to build trust and, and to get more ideas, whereas the other district is very much holding everything close to the, close to the chest and only letting information out in dribs and drabs. Um, Neither one of them is an easy position to be in, but you can imagine the responses that they're having from their communities given each of these things. So again, sort of telling the truth early, being transparent, this idea of simplifying complexity, I think is probably one of the most interesting things to think about. Um, how do you make a very complex, again, ambiguous um, issue uh, simple for people to understand? And that doesn't mean that you simplify the idea, but rather how you communicate about it. Um, you know, as, a, as, a, as someone who, who teaches doctoral students and chairs dissertations, sometimes more words are just more words. Um, and what we really are looking for is sort of concise, simplified thinking about a very complex problem and how that helps communities um, also react in positive ways. I mean, I think in, in these, these, these things develop the trust that's necessary to weather crises, be they episodic or emergent, um, and allow and give us the freedom and the opportunity to sort of act and experiment early um, because they, because essentially our community, our partners um, are, um, trust us. 
and and again leadership you know trust is sort of the the foundation of leadership as well um, and so by doing these kinds of things we we can take those 28 days um, that Peterson talks about to actually do that quick learning and act and experiment often um, Sort of a lot, right? Sort of like how I'm framing the way that I'm thinking about these things and now thinking about, well, what needs to happen? Um, and I think this idea of rethinking old thinking, um, that's, that's where I'm at right now, um, and how to rethink old thinking. I mean, we have professional and program standards, and we have the, the NELPs and the P cells that articulate a set of competencies and skills. Um, and disposition that, that, that we prepare and that we think are important for leadership. Um, and these standards are essential. I mean, and there's no way of thinking that they're not. Um, what I'm trying to push myself into thinking is that we need more. Um, and we need more to really um, uh, expand the way that we're thinking about this. And so this idea of epistemologies, rethinking epistemologies, relationships, and processes. And I love the fact that I can use the, the word epistemologies because my students will tell you that's one of my favorite words. Um, and and because uh, epistemologies are really about how do we come to know what we know? Um, and who decides and who owns that. And the idea of, ha of really thinking about knowledge in different ways um, lets us you know, rethink who owns that knowledge. Um, how do we theorize in new ways and how do we become adaptive? Um, in terms of relationships, again, what kinds of relationships um, you know, do we have with, um, and how do we rethink those relationships with communities and in partnerships, and how do we actually create authentic collaborative relationships and sort of, instead of sort of parallel playing in the sandbox, um, or thinking of each other as sort of frenemies, but really becoming authentic with um, relationships that have a common, a common goal. Um, I think in times of crisis and in scarcity of what we have now, we don't have the luxury of being siloed. We really have to think across contexts in new ways. Um, in terms of our processes as well, um, you know, how do we engage in our self-study? How do we study and learn from ourselves and our experiences and what's happening? Um, I'm really interested in, in issues of diversifying the pipeline and even thinking differently about where we're looking to help us diversify that. I mean, the teacher prep, leadership prep um, pipeline is a really clear one um, and it's gonna be really important. But in my work with Latinx leadership, they often begin their educational trajectories in community colleges and they often begin their professional trajectories as um, classroom aides. So how do we even think differently about the pipeline and ways of strengthening that? Um, and then in terms of capacities, and I'm really interested in capacity as, you know, in, in my role as the executive director of UCEA, um, because really thinking about what is our capacity to imagine something different, um, to keep us from tinkering at the edges, but to do the real important internal work that it takes to be um, uh, an organization that stands for equity. Um, and how do we do that work and disrupt those very systems that we actually identify with? Um, and in doing that in ways that are respectful and, and, and reflect sort of the best in us. Um, what, and so I think my last point here is sort of like, what are we doing ourselves? Like, what do I see as the trajectory, as, as sort of the next steps in our evolution? Um, I think it's really important to think you know, humans are constantly evolving, organizations are constantly evolving, and we need to recognize that and embrace that. Because it's not just about change um, and what we're doing differently, but rather thinking about an evolution that's purposeful and that lets us be better. Um, and so again, here thinking about some of the issues that, that I'm thinking about, like, you know, how do, we, how do we think and rethink our commitments, our histories, and even the trajectories um, where we're going. Um, and how do we involve and create these spaces in ways that are equitable um, and that allow things like imagination and respect and love and hope to grow. Um, and there's a lot more here, but, but um, that's for another conversation, I think. And I think, um, you know, finally, it's like, I love this idea of angelic troublemakers. Um, you know, um, uh, this idea that, that um, we are all in this together and that we want the same things for our kids, um, that we, um, 
you know, that, that we want to disrupt these, these systems that we're so wedded to, but again, do it in ways that are, that are steeped in love and hope and kinship, understanding our humanity, understanding that things need to change and be better, but doing it in a way that allows each of us to be an angelic troublemaker and hopefully for all of us at some point, create a normal that is just and equitable for everybody. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, I'm, I hope we have time for questions. I didn't, I timed myself and it did not go that long. So I apologize, Matt. Uh, I, I think I think your comments were uh, spot on, Monica, and I, I really appreciate, um, I, you know, you raised so many questions for me, um, and I, ho I hope the same thing holds true with our, with our participants today. I think um, for me, you know, a lot of the utility of your comments helps me to situate my professional and personal situation in a, in a larger context, to begin to think about um, not only ha how is my role changing personally, but also how is, how is our work with principles and future principles changing as well? Mm. Um, and so that's, I, I will say that for me personally, that was, that was incredibly helpful. Um, because I think that during this period, we are going to see an evolution of the principal position. Uh, and we're also, uh, we're already seeing a lot of that. And I'm sure the folks on the line um, today are hearing from the voices of principals as they're going through these crises, as they're embedded in their communities and trying to respond uh, with, um, in the best way that they can for their for their students. Um, so uh, anyway, this is uh, both, I think, uh, the beginning uh, or the end of a conversation because this is the fifth in a five part uh, series, of course. And I think, Monica, I really appreciate you putting a capstone on this and helping to elevate the conversation um, as well. Um, I would say that it's also a uh, beginning in a lot of ways. If you could move to the next slide kind of briefly. Um, first of all, as I've said with all of the series, I think that, um, that we are very open to your ideas, your questions, uh, uh, in order to uh, continue on the conversation. And I hope I can speak for Monica on this respect as well, that we like to introduce ideas and provocative questions so that you can follow up and have our com these conversations. Um, and additionally, it's, um, it's uh, the beginning of maybe a new uh, e-learning series. Uh, so uh, we are beginning to plan the next iteration after listening to your ideas and your questions. Um, and so we'll be sending out an announcement about that soon. Um, but I think the next series will focus on the, uh, the evolution of the principalship uh, and the direction uh, that, um, that the profession is moving. Um, and also how can we support uh, principals in their current positions and, and future principals as well. So um, I know we're in overtime, but uh, I wanna thank you again all uh, for attending uh, this session. Um, for those engaged in the UPPI network, we hope that you'll close out this session and then click on the link in your email to join the discussion where uh, Monica will be with us for a little while longer and we'll get to pepper her with questions. Uh, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then lastly, as you do close out uh, today, um, you will receive a, uh, a quick uh, feedback form. Uh, we take your feedback very seriously. Um, uh, we listen to the ideas that you have and we uh, try to respond uh, to them by, um, by contacting you directly or bringing uh, ideas and resources to the table. Uh, so uh, thanks to everyone for joining today and uh, for the UPPI network, we'll see you in the next discussion session. Thank you, Matt. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.